Alexa, stop. Let's go outside. Just kidding, we're not taking the Mini out where we're going today. Today, we will be taking the Golf and doing something really exciting. All right, so today we've got some really cool stuff planned. So, as you probably saw in the thumbnail or in the title, this is going to be the beginning of a full start to finish engine rebuild on an A-Series motor. Now, my good friend Justin, who has taught me pretty much the lion's share of the stuff I know about classic Minis to me over the years, um, he has a 998 motor, a series with a magic wand shifter and he's also got a mini moke and for those of you who don't know that's going to be popping up on the screen here and the mini moke is a variant of the mini that was produced originally for the british military and then the british military saw this thing and they're like that is not going to cut it guys that's really not going to work out for us so British Motoring Company went ahead and continued to produce it, and then it ended up becoming like kind of a cult classic. It was sold to a lot of hipsters, a lot of people who like going to the beach, and now it's become kind of this fun car that people who love the Mini also love this car and want to restore. Now, he's got a motor in that car already, but this 998 we thought would be a perfect opportunity to to go from the beginning to the end of an engine rebuild, and then past that, we might do some engine performance updates to it as well, We'll have to wait and see if it's worthwhile to do those engine updates. Uh, that'll be something that we'll approach as we're pulling the motor apart and we get to that stage of the build. Now one of the cool things about this build is that my mini parts sponsor, 7 Mini Parts, is going to be sponsoring this build from start to finish. And what that means is that throughout the process I'll be able to show you guys exactly the products that we use in this build as well as a general estimate of the cost to do something like this. One of the most common questions I receive is how much it's going to cost to rebuild a motor in the car. And generally speaking, it's not something that there's always a fixed cost for because each motor is a little bit different and each of the problems with each of those motors is a little bit different. But what I'm hoping to give you guys is an estimate of how much it would cost to do a performance job and how much it would cost to do kind of a standard rebuild job. Because I know not everybody wants to put a whole bunch of performance parts in their Mini. Some people just want to bring it back stock and get it running the way it did when it came off the assembly line. So throughout this build process, I'll be posting all of the links to the products we'll be using in the description of each video. And this build will probably take around two, three months. It might take a little longer, might be a little bit faster. I'll also be doing all the regular DIY videos I'd normally do. I'll be doing my odd jobs videos. I'll be finishing the rally dash, blah, 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 blah. It's not gonna change the other videos that I'm making, but this is gonna be its own kind of separate segment. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the journey of this engine rebuild. But now let's head up to the north side of Charlotte and pick up this motor. All right, so we are back at Justin's garage now, and he's got some pretty cool stuff in here right now. That's his regular Mini under wraps. He's got his Mini Moke over here, and then this MG is a customer car that he is working on. But what we're doing with this whole thing is we are going to be taking the motor out of this Moke, and it's got a 998 in there already, and it's in pretty good shape. It runs, but he's looking for something that has a little bit more pep and is just a little bit more put together and rebuilt and just solid. He drives the smoke pretty much any time that it's warm. You know, he takes us to work, blah, 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 blah. 
This thing is awesome little car, um, and it's just a blast to drive. But what we'll be doing is pulling this motor, and as you can see, it's that standard green motor, but we'll be taking the transmission and clutch off of this motor and putting it onto the new motor that we're rebuilding. And so Justin has taken apart the motor already. This was a project that he was working on and is kind of getting taken over by me and some mini parts. But what we have here is a 1275 head. We have the transmission stuff that's down on the bottom, but I won't be taking that. Um, standard camshaft, standard pistons, and these pistons are actually gonna get replaced with some really nice flat top pistons that he's already got here. So this is gonna have a little bit of compression. It's gonna be a slick motor, but we'll be replacing those pistons and I'll be going over all the parts here in this cart once I get it back to my house and everything's kind of laid out. But let's go ahead and take a look at the block and we can see what that looks like and the condition that's in. So we got the block here and it's in Kind of rough shape. Um, this is a, uh, a, a good lesson in coating your parts in oil before you put them in storage, but he got this motor. It was in already kind of rough shape, but it overheated from, uh, from my understanding, and this is going to be a really great candidate for overboring because, I mean, the pistons, the it's not the worst in there. They're not a whole bunch of ridging and everything, but you know, this thing is probably gonna have to get bored a little bit anyways, so we might as well just bring it up plus six on the pistons, which will fit those new pistons that uh, are flat top. But this'll get cleaned, this'll get polished, it might have to get turned, we'll see, and then uh, and then we'll put it all back in the motor. So I said we needed a truck for stuff. Golf fits all the stuff, perfect. Okay, so now we're back at the house got the block here, I've got the head here, and then I've got all of the parts to the motor itself behind me. And so I want to give you guys kind of an overview of what we're looking at here so you have an idea of what we're aiming for, the problems that are associated with this block and any block that you might work on. There's kind of like three and a half main components to the motor. You have your cylinder head, which sits on top, and that's this right here. You have your engine block, which holds the pistons, the camshaft, your uh, distributor, your oil pump, really everything that's that's kind of mechanical, it's moving and spinning in the motor. And then underneath, on the bottom of this, you actually have your transmission. And then on the side over here, you have your clutch. Now looking at the motor here, the side that's going to be facing towards the front of the car is the one that has this nameplate on it. So if you get down to working on your motor and you can't remember which side is which, the front has your nameplate on it or your uh, engine number plate on it. It's a small hole for your distributor right on the front, and then your oil filter housing, at least the mounting spot for that. That's the kind of front of the motor. The technical front of the motor is actually where the radiator sits. And the reason that's technically the front of the motor is if you guys remember, or if you don't know, the mini motor, the thing that made it so revolutionary is they mounted it transversely, which means they took the motor where this would be the front, this would be the back with the transmission going off into the back of the car. They actually turned the motor sideways so that it would fit in this small space. But what that means is the front of the motor, where the radiator and everything is, got turned to the side over the wheel well. Now, now to get started looking at this motor, I'm going to actually be using my phone. I'll be cutting back and forth between these two pieces of footage. So what we're looking at here on the top of the motor is your pistons, one to four, and four being on the side with the clutch housing. So let's go ahead and look inside these cylinders. And as you can see, there's a lot of rust inside these cylinders. And that's probably because this motor actually had an overheating problem. That's what actually decommissioned this motor. And you can tell that because there's a lot of pitting here on the top of the head, as well as rust and general wear inside these cylinders. Now this rust could also be just because it sat for a long time. The rust is really just indicative of moisture and the fact that it hasn't been running because if you run a car that has rusty sidewalls on it, it's most likely going to knock that rust off. You could run into a lot of other problems, but, um, but as we look down here in these cylinders, you can kind of see how there's kind of ridging, especially on the back there, you can see that. And then you can see all of the kind of pitting and everything like that. Now, because of that, because it's so worn down, we've got a couple different options. In this scenario, what we're going to be doing is boring these cylinders over. And what that means is we're going to take these cylinders and make the holes bigger. 
we're going to need a bigger piston, piston rings, everything to fill out that new space. Now these motors from the factory were sold all the way up until a 1275cc and this block is a 998cc. What that means is that if we bring these over, we're going to be getting, we're going to be increasing the total combustion chamber inside those cylinders. So in our case, we're going to be taking our new pistons, which are plus six, and that's uh, an additional 60 mil on each one, which will add additional space in the combustion chamber. Those pistons are also flat top, which means they're going to have a higher compression and the motor is going to be a little bit stronger in addition to having a bigger combustion chamber. Now, you might be wondering, what are all these other holes on the top of your motor? And, and the holes on top of the motor here are really used for various different things. So if you look on the back here, these holes along the back, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these holes on the back, that is where your push rods sit. Now the push rods look like this. They're simply rods that are moved by your camshaft and they control when the valves open and close. So your rods come up through here and then your rocker arm sits on top of those and as the cam rotates and the lobes lift these push rods up and down, your valves open and close. And that's what controls the intake and the exhaust of the gases and fuel into your motor so it can blow up and make your car move. Now to build on that, you have your cylinder head here and it sits on your motor like so and the rods actually come up through your cylinder head and your rocker arm sits right on top. And these are your valves, they open and close. They're all taped right now so that they don't fall out. Um, and normally there are springs on these, on these valves as well that hold them closed and create tension on those so that they'll spring back open when they're not being used. So let's take this back off. Next, you have small holes all around the cylinders, here, 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 all around, and those are your channels for water. Now, as you can imagine, when a motor is running, it generates a lot of heat uh, because of all of the combustion, the explosions, the heat, the gas, all of it combined makes the motor get really hot. And these channels in your block allow the water to pass through all the different sides of your block and that water to cool the motor and keep your motor from overheating. Now the cool thing is that the water passing through your motor is driven by the explosions that are happening in these cylinders. And the way that works is you have a belt that connects to your water pump and the water pump sits on the side with your radiator so that the fan can be driven as well by that belt. And as this spins, this is going to pump water through the motor using that water pump on the side here. It's actually a pretty simple concept, but it works quite well. There's lots of different water pumps out there. There's some that are ultra high efficiency. There are some that are stock and, uh, and they just have various benefits that allow the water to pass more quickly and allow the motor to cool more efficiently. So let's take a look on the side here. This is where your water pump sits and you can kind of see in there, there's lots of space for water to pass through and all around your block. And then in your cylinder head, it has the same concept. It has channels inside the cylinder head that allow the water to pass around and through the whole head to cool it as well. There's another hole right over here. This is where your heater comes off and runs to your heater. And then everything goes back into your radiator, is cycled through the motor, cooled, and then the whole process repeats itself. Now the last thing that's on the top of this block that I'm gonna show you guys today is your screw holes for your head studs. This these screw holes are what allow your head to be tightened down onto the block at an even rate and sandwich your air management system that happens in the head and thus creating the combustion chambers that are underneath the cylinder head. All right, so now that we've covered the kind of top side of the motor here, and we've kind of covered everything that's on the top of the block for right now at least, let's go ahead and flip this over and I'll show you a little bit more about how this <coughs> block works. So now we're looking at the back side of the motor. Your exhaust normally runs down here and out the back of the car. And what you're looking at here is just your fuel pump mounting system. So there's a mechanical fuel pump on these motors and it gets mounted into this hole. Now I don't actually have it here. I think I might have left it at Justin's house, but the general concept along with most of the other stuff that's on this motor is it's mechanically driven. As the engine is spinning, it's using that combustion and that spinning and the mechanical works inside the motor to 
actuate your fuel pump and actually pump gasoline to keep it running. So it's almost like a closed loop system. You have your gasoline making explosions. The explosions then drive the pump that put more gasoline into it. It's pretty cool. Now let's move this over onto this side, onto the other side here. Now this is the same side that the water pump was mounted on. And this is the side that's facing your radiator, just a reminder. And this is also the side that the timing cover goes on and the timing chain. So let me grab the camshaft for you. So what we have here is the stop camshaft that came out of it. And that runs straight through this hole right here. And it's what actually moves those push rods up and down, like I mentioned before. So this slides in here. I'm not actually gonna put it in because it can be a little bit difficult to get in and out. But what happens is, is that as this spins, as the motor drives this, you have this gear that holds your timing chain. So as that spins, it keeps time with the crankshaft as it's spinning. So you have a chain that comes around this gear right here and connects to your crankshaft. And the crankshaft spins your camshaft. It's all very mechanical. More modern cars might use dual overhead cams, which means one cam controls the intake and one controls the exhaust. In this case, we have one cam that controls both intake and exhaust. Some modern cars don't even have a camshaft. They just use electrical actuation of those valves, which is pretty cool too. So let's set this aside and let's flip this over one more time. Now what we're looking at here is obviously the bottom of the motor. Now in the bottom of your motor, you can see this cast block is actually quite thick and all these holes in the back are those push rod holes. And then you have your cylinders and then right here is where your crankshaft sits. So let me grab that real quick. Now this right here is a crankshaft. Now you can see here there's four off-center mounting points. That's for all four of the pistons. Then you have your left, middle, and side mounting spots where they sit into the main bearings and then are clamped onto the block. And this, this is arguably the most important part of your motor. So as this spins, like so, your pistons, this move up and down, and that's what drives the wheels on your car. So because this bar is here, I can't actually set it all the way down in there. And I wouldn't want to because I don't actually have bearings in there. And I'll go over bearings once we start putting this back together. But, but for right now, what you need to know is that pistons mount here, this mounts to your block, and then this drives the gears of your car. So let's go ahead and lift this, put this back where it was. Oh, one other thing. You can see there's actually quite a bit of rust on this. And that happens when you let these things kind of sit outside and they can oxidize. If you are disassembling your motor and you're taking all of this stuff out, it's very, very important that you coat these things with oil if you're going to reuse them. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to do something like getting the crank polished or if, it's a very, or if it's really damaged, you might even have to get your crank turned, which means they take some metal off of these mounting points. So to avoid that, coat this in oil, something like WD-40, uh, some sort of silicon lubricant. Just keep in mind that if you use something that's not compatible with the oils in your car, you're gonna have to take that oil off when you start to assemble it and put the proper assembly lubrication onto it. So let's go ahead and set this aside. All right, so now we can kind of set this block aside. We're done with this for right now. I'm gonna move into the head and give you guys a little bit more detail on the valves and how all of that works. So let's set this down, this super heavy block, and, uh, and we'll get into some other stuff. All right, so let's move on to this head. Now the top side of this head is pretty straightforward. You don't have a lot of the same holes that you have on the bottom of the motor. You have your heater takeoff here, you have your stud bolt locations here, 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 and then you have your actual valves, your push rods pass through here, and then you have your spark hole plugs right on the front here. And then obviously you have your thermostat housing. This is where the water is allowed into your radiator or prevented from it while the motor's still warming up. Let's flip this over and I can show you guys what the cool parts of the motor look like. So on the back you have your two intake ports and then your three exhaust ports. Now this is one of those things that make the Mini kind of cool as well. You have both your intake and exhaust ports on one side in a 2-3 configuration. Now most modern motors are cross flow or they have a kind of a different configuration for this. But this is also what helped make the Mini's engine 
so compact and fit into that small space. So one of the things that a lot of people do when they are doing performance work to the motor is they will actually put on something called a cross flow head. Now these things are really, really cool. Should be showing up right here. But the idea is that the air goes in the front of the head, straight in the front, and then you have your regular exhaust on the back of the head. Now, there's a lot of different configurations. Some are seven port heads, some are eight port heads. With a seven port head, what you have is four intake ports on the front instead of two on the back. And then you have three exhaust ports, the stock exhaust ports on the back, and they all go down into a single exhaust and out the back of your car. Unless you have some crazy exhaust, that's the general gist of how that works. If you have an eight port head, you'll still have four intake ports on the front, but you'll also have four exhaust ports on the front. And what that means is every single cylinder has its own intake and exhaust. And that creates an intense amount of flow through your motor and allows the most air, the most fuel, the most combustion to happen in each cylinder. But in this scenario, what we're looking at here is a 1275 cylinder head. So this was made for a 1275 motor. There's a ton of different information about these cylinder heads, but it's all centered around how much flow it has and how big the combustion chamber is that the head actually allows you to create. So there's two things that determine your combustion chamber size. So the first being how big the motor is bored to. So my motor is bored to 1293, which means 1293 cubic centimeters of space inside your combustion chamber. And then this motor, the block over here, is bored to 998, but we're gonna bring each piston over by 0 0.6, 0 0.06, I can never remember, but we're gonna be bringing the combustion chamber a little bit larger on the cylinder, but something else that can help determine the cylinder's uh, combustion chamber size and the way that it explodes is the space here where the valves actually sit. Now, taking a look at this, you can actually kind of you can actually see which valve allows the air in and which one allows the air out. And so, you'll see there are two intake ports right here. And those valves are right next to each other here, and those allow your air in to the motor. And then these two, the smaller valves, allow the air to exit. Now, obviously, you don't want them both opening at the same time. And what happens is as the camshaft actuates, this valve will open, allow air in. Because they're taped, it's kind of hard to get them to open. But they open up, allow air into the motor and fuel into the motor. They shut. And then you have your spark plug, which is this hole right here in each one of the cylinders. And that creates a spark. It will explode, push the piston down, and then after that combustion, that, that bang happens, you have your exhaust stroke. And that is when this valve will open up. So this will open up, the piston will come back up in the chamber and push the air out through that valve and throughout that port. And then that'll shut and the whole process repeats itself. The general concept behind the way a motor runs is not hyper complex, but the complexities come in when you're trying to time everything to explode, to spin, without hitting each other and all running in unison and running smoothly. Now, one other thing I'm just going to show you real quick on the bottom of the cylinder head. Right here is a bypass, and that actually allows coolant to pass out of your block into the radiator and get taken back into the radiator, um, even if the thermostat is not open all the way yet. Now I only have one more thing that I'm going to show you guys today while I'm doing the overview of all the different parts on the motor, at least the most important parts. And the last thing that I'm going to show you is the pistons. So I'm going to take this piston, this is one of the old ones, and let's go ahead and open up one of the new pistons so you can get a comparison of what this looks like. Now there's a few different things that make up a piston and the way that it all comes together, but you have your connecting rod and that's what connects to your crankshaft. And then you have the piston itself, and then you have piston rings that keep the seal inside the cylinder. Now the stock pistons that come on a Mini are 
dish type pistons. And what that means is, let me get a little bit closer look here for you guys. Now, the pistons that come on the Mini are a dish type piston. And let me show you guys what that means. If you can see here, go ahead and try and get that in focus. This piston actually has a small dish on the top and it creates kind of a almost little pool. And this is a pretty mild type of piston. It doesn't have a huge compression ratio, but it's good, it's stock, it's standard, and it does what it needs to do. Then you have your connecting rod that runs down to your crankshaft and there are bearings that sit in here. And then these pistons are numbered as well. As you can see, there are two ticks on this one. And Justin did that, not everyone does that, and it's very important. And that number is where the piston is so that you can put the same connecting rod back on your crankshaft where it needed to go before. Now, if you're disassembling your motor, it's very important that you, one, keep all of the bolts in the same place that they were before. As you can see, this is still connected on the connecting rod here. And then a major pro tip is actually marking these connecting rods across the gap here so that you know which side this goes back on and which location the piston actually sits on your crankshaft. Now let's take a look at this new piston. As you can see here, it's got the same piston ring set up as the other piston did, give or take a little bit of space. And then the major difference is that this piston is a little bit larger and is a flat top piston. Now the benefit of a flat top piston is that you have a much higher compression ratio. So you get more tightly compacted air and fuel mixture on top of the piston, which means a bigger boom and a better push of the piston, which translates to more power. So that's one of the main reasons that Justin picked up these flat top pistons. Now you'll see here too, that it, they do come with piston rings and they actually tell you which location they go in, which is pretty cool. Now that's it for the kind of start, the kickoff of this motor rebuild. The first step is gonna be getting all of these components to the machine shop and getting them, you know, polished, bored, cleaned, get everything all the way it needs to be so that we can actually start reassembling this motor. Now, I know some of you probably were hoping that I would show actually disassembling this motor, but since Justin did that a few months ago already, I wasn't able to show you that process. But don't worry, I'm gonna go into a lot of detail when I start to put the motor back together and start covering how everything needs to get pushed back together, screwed in, how it needs to be tightened. I'm gonna go into excruciating detail for you guys. So definitely look forward to that if you're into that kind of thing. If you're not into that, sorry. And then before we go, I wanna say a big thank you to 7 Mini Parts for sponsoring this build for helping to provide the parts that are gonna be used to rebuild this motor, to get this back into Justin's Moke and running at tip top shape. It's gonna be really slick once it gets all put back together. It's gonna to look really good. So thank you so much, 7 Mini Parts. If you guys are in North America, check out 7 Mini Parts. They carry a ton of different mini parts and have been the absolute best sponsor for this channel. They believed in the channel right from the beginning and they helped support me and and helped me start making great videos for you guys. So check back soon on this engine rebuild. It's gonna be a really great journey and I will catch you guys in the next video. Motor on.